Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special event, The History of Jew Hatred, The Never-Ending Story, a discussion with our outstanding guest, Ben Freeman. Tonight's event is taking place on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. While Yom HaShoah is our community's day to grieve and remember together, International Holocaust Remembrance Day is a day to educate. Thank you for joining us for this inspiring and educational event. My name is Jared Shore. I'm the co-president of Calgary Jewish Federation. It is my pleasure to be your host and moderator this evening, along with Edmontonian Jordan Wright coming to us from Montreal tonight. Jordan herself was the target of a toxic anti-Semitic campaign by members of the Student Society of McGill University in 2019. Jordan has the Jewish pride that Ben will speak of tonight and that we only wish to instill in all of our young leaders. All right, uh, before we dive into tonight's event, it is a great honor for me to deliver a land acknowledgement to acknowledge the people who first inhabited the lands upon which we meet today. I'll be specifically talking about the areas now known as Calgary and Edmonton, but if you're calling from somewhere else, like myself, I encourage you to learn more about the history of the area that you're joining us from. In the spirit of respect and truth, I acknowledge that those of us joining from Calgary are gathered on Treaty 7 territory, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot, which includes the Siksiga, the Bigani, and the Gaina First Nations, the Stony Nakoda, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations, and the Sutina First Nation. The city of Calgary is also the traditional homeland of the historic Northwest Métis and is home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Those joining us from Edmonton are gathered on what is now known as Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Nahio or Cree, the Dene, the Anishinaabe, or Sluto, Nakoda Iska, or Nakoda Sioux, and the Nitsitapi, or Blackfoot peoples. 
We also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and the home of one of the largest communities of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. An acknowledgement of the land on which we gather is only the beginning of how all of us can make the world a better place. In the spirit of tikkun olam, the Jewish value of repairing the world, I encourage you to learn more about the peoples who lived here before us and continue to live here. We owe our gratitude to the original stewards of these lands that watched over it for many years and today so that we can be here and learn about how to combat anti-Jewish hate and the meaning of Jewish pride. Before we begin, uh, we'd like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors tonight and review a few housekeeping notes. Firstly, tonight's event has been made possible because of the partnership between Calgary and Edmonton Jewish Federation and the Edmonton and Calgary Public Libraries and their sponsors. We're grateful not only for the special relationship that we have with our Jewish community up in Edmonton, but for the fruitful partnership we have with our respective public libraries. Our goal is to educate and inspire, and there is no better place to ignite that initiative than with our great public libraries. I must also extend an enormous thank you and Yasher Koaf to Marnie Bonder and Dahlia Libin, co-chairs of Calgary Jewish Federation's Holocaust and Human Rights Department. Our community is so grateful that the two of you are leading the charge to keep the memory of the Holocaust and the experience of our community survivors in the hearts and minds of Jewish and non-Jewish Calgarians and Albertans alike. And likewise, I'd like to thank Jen McGalnick, our Edmonton Jewish Federation partner in this incredibly important work. Thank you all. Um, so now it's also my pleasure to review some housekeeping notes. So the first is that at the end of this program, there will be a survey with the link sent in the chat for the webinar. And it will also appear when you leave the webinar to let us know what you thought of tonight's event. At the bottom of your screen, there's a chat function, which looks a little bit like a speech bubble. So please use this option to ask questions for our speaker. If you need technical help, you can get it from the library staff or you can leave your comments in the chat as well. Um, and we will get to some of the questions you ask partway through our discussion tonight. The program tonight is also being recorded and will be available at a later date. Please check back on the library's websites for more information. Finally, there is a Yad Vashem exhibition going on in both Edmonton and Calgary that I highly encourage you to visit if you have the opportunity. Um, in Calgary, there is the Stars Without a Heaven exhibit, which is going on at the Central Library. And in Edmonton, the Shoah, How Is It Humanly Possible exhibit is going on at the Milner Library. And both of these are open until January 31st. It is now our pleasure to introduce the CEOs of the Calgary and Edmonton Public Library. Sarah Mueller is the CEO of the Calgary Public Library. Sarah completed her undergrad degree from the University of Calgary and her Master of Library and Information Science degree from the University of Western Ontario. With over 15 years of experience at the CPL, Sarah has served a variety of roles, including as the Director of Service Delivery responsible for the new Central Library Project. Recently, she oversaw the library's pandemic response. She's passionate about the ways in which public libraries transform lives and build community. Sarah, while our relationship with the CPL is far from symbolic, we note that tonight the archway at the Central Library is lit symbolically in honor of Holocaust remembrance. Tonight, we would also like to welcome Pilar Martinez, the CEO of the Edmonton Public Library. Pilar holds an MLIS from the University of Alberta and a Bachelor of Arts with Honors in English from Acadia University. She brings her wealth of experience in leadership, advocacy, and strategic planning. Pilar is very active in the library community and currently serves on several boards nationwide, in addition to her work as the CEO of Edmonton Public Library, including the Canadian Urban Libraries Council, OCLC's Global Regional and America's Regional Councils, and the Public Lending Rights Commission. She is also an adjunct professor for the University of Alberta School of Library and Information Studies, where she also serves as a school council member. Please welcome our Calgary and Edmonton Public Library CEOs for their remarks. Thanks so much, Jared and Jordan. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Mueller, and it's a real honor to be here tonight with all of you and to be co-hosting this event with Edmonton Public Library. So in honor of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, it's very exciting that as Jared mentioned, 
Prominent building structures across Canada are being brilliantly illuminated this evening. Illuminating major landmarks and prominent public spaces on this very important day of remembrance aims to place the Holocaust, Holocaust education, and anti-Semitism into mainstream public discourse. As Jared mentioned, um, there's lots of uh, different groups that are supporting this event tonight, and we're really thrilled for that. Um, the events, the, the lighting of different uh, monuments include uh, in Calgary, the Calgary Tower with yellow glowing lights representing a memorial candle flame. The Northern Alberta Jubilee Auditorium in Edmonton will also be lit in yellow. And of course, the Central Library um, with the commemorative flame on the archway. Um, these programs are supported uh, by the Isidore and Florence Burstyn Memorial Fund for Human Rights and Holocaust Education, the KSW Calgary Holocaust Education and Commemoration Endowment Fund, Viewpoint Foundation, and donors to the Human Rights and Holocaust Education Fund at the Calgary Public Library Foundation. In fact, tonight's event marks the official launch of the Human Rights and Holocaust Education Fund at the Calgary Public Library Foundation, that's intended to support programming, enable physical exhibits and virtual tours that build on programs and events, facilitate community storytelling opportunities and enhance library collections related to human rights. Thanks to all of our guests for joining us this evening for this important conversation and, uh, you know, really taking a moment to understand the importance of this day and what it means for all of us as we move towards the future. Pilar, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. And I too am just delighted to be here in this virtual space with you. And thank you so much for joining us for this profound event commemorating International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The United Nations General Assembly designated January 27th, the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. On this annual day of commemoration, the UN urges people to honor the more than 6 million Jewish victims of the Holocaust and millions of other victims of Nazism. Auschwitz was the largest of the German Nazi concentration camps and extermination centers where over 1.1 million people lost their lives. Today marks 77 years since its liberation. The Holocaust was an unparalleled genocide total and systematic, systematic from 1933 to 1945, perpetuated by Nazi Germany and its collaborators. Its goal was to extinguish the Jewish people from the face of the earth. To fully understand the Holocaust, it's important to learn about anti-Semitism, thought to be the longest hatred of a group of people. Sadly, the end of the Holocaust did not abolish anti-Semitism and it continues to exist today all over the world. This day, today of remembrance, gives us an opportunity to remember the lives lost and to honor the survivors. The Edmonton and Calgary Public Libraries are proud to partner with and support both the Calgary and Edmonton Jewish Federations. I'll now, now turn it back over to Jordan and Jared. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and Pilar. Your organizations play a critical role in the quality of life and education in this province. We are grateful for your leadership. And I'm personally grateful that both libraries now forgive fines for overdue materials. We are honored today to be joined by the mayors of Calgary and Edmonton. Mayor Jyoti Gondek is a longtime Prairie girl. Born in the UK, Mayor Gondek moved to Manitoba with her family when she was four years old. She moved to Alberta shortly after marrying her husband, Todd, and has served in key positions in the public and private sector for decades. In 2017, Mayor Gondek was elected councillor for Ward 3. And as she described to me in a meeting with our community leadership this fall, she made the decision to run for mayor after seeing the steps of City Hall occupied by white supremacists in a 2020 protest. Mayor Gondek comes from a long, proud Sikh tradition. She understands how ge geopolitical conflicts across the world are often oversimplified and misunderstood. The name Jyoti means light in Punjabi. Mayor, our community's values are reflected in the Jewish imperative to be the light among nations. Tonight, our community and the city come together in the light of remembrance and education 
as symbolized by the lighting of the Calgary Tower in honor of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We thank you for the relationship we already have and the strengthening of that relationship yet to come. Uh, Mayor Amarjeet Sohi's story is one that can inspire us all, and it is my pleasure to introduce him as a proud Edmontonian myself. Mayor Sohi was born in Punjab and moved to Edmonton with his parents when he was just 18, and by his own report, learned to speak English at our very own public libraries here in Edmonton. He's been dedicated to the betterment of Edmonton for quite some time, having been involved in his local union since his days working as a bus driver for the Edmonton Transit System. Mayor Sowie helped to launch the Millwoods Crime Council as a community advocate, served on city council for eight years, and most recently was the member of parliament for Edmonton Millwoods and Minister of Natural Resources before serving as our mayor. Mayor Sowie, thank you so much for supporting our community tonight as this, at this important event to remember and to remember the atro atrocities of the Holocaust or the Shoah to do our best to educate ourselves so we can protect ourselves and others from hate. Education can be a powerful tool. We thank you for your presence here tonight so we can all continue to learn and grow as our relationship with you as a community grows as well. We now welcome Mayor Gondek and Mayor Sohi for their remarks. I'd like to thank all the organizers for including me in this important day. And it is my honor to share the screen with my colleague, Mayor Sohi from Edmonton. We share a commitment to making our cities welcoming for all who live here. At the city of Calgary, we're committed to the work of being an anti-racist city. We simply cannot afford to be passive in this regard. We must be proactive, intentional, and focused on actions that move us forward as a society, especially in these troubled times. We cannot ignore incidents like the hostage taking at Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas, nor can we ignore the abhorrent appropriation of the Yellow Star of David as a symbol of global anti-vaccination movements. And we cannot forget the atrocities of the past or we are doomed to repeat history. We must be ever vigilant of the consequences of hate-fueled division. Many thanks to the Calgary Jewish Federation for the incredible work that you do in our community. I have great optimism that through groups such as yours, we will ensure that the light of unity shines much brighter than any shadow of fear. And with that, I give you the City of Calgary's proclamation. Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Israel, defines the Holocaust as, quote, an unprecedented genocide, total and systematic, perpetrated in Europe from 1933 to 1945 by Nazi Germany and its collaborators with the aim of annihilating the Jewish people from the face of the earth, end quote. A global and local commitment to eliminate anti-Semitism, racism, and discrimination is crucial to prevent such atrocities against humankind. Whereas not only was the Holocaust an attempt to eliminate Jewish people, but millions of others from additional minority groups were persecuted based on racial, racial nationalism, homophobia, and hatred. Whereas the Holocaust must never be forgotten, yet one in five Canadian youth are unaware of the events that occurred during the Holocaust. Whereas more than 8,000 people of Jewish faith reside in Calgary, including Holocaust survivors and their families, Whereas Calgarians are encouraged to honor the memory of Holocaust victims and survivors and to eliminate acts of anti-Semitism, racism, and discrimination in our community, on behalf of City Council and the citizens of Calgary, I hereby proclaim January 27, 2022 as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Over to my colleague, Mayor Sohi. Well, thank you, Mayor Gondek, for that moving recognition. Uh, uh, I would also like to make a pro proclamation as well, but first I wanna briefly reflect on why recognizing this day is so important. The effects of the tragedy of the Holocaust are still felt around the world by survivors, the families and the friends of those who were lost. This day shows us how important it is to continue our fight against racism, anti-Semitism, and hate as we work toward creating a truly welcoming city for the many diverse communities that call Alberta home. When we join together to learn from the past, to celebrate the things that make us unique and to stand up to hate, we can help build a great city for today and for future generations. Thank you for attending today's educational event 
and for taking the time to commemorate this important day. So with that, I would like to proclaim on behalf of City Council and all Edmontonians. There we go. But as the United Nations General Assembly has designated January 27th International Holocaust Remembrance Day to commemorate the victims of Nazi regime and promote Holocaust education. But as this year we commemorated the 77th anniversary of the liberation of the Austria concentration camp. And whereas United Nations members hold annual ceremonies to honor the stories of survivors and those who lost. Whereas City of Edmonton recognizes the contribution of the Jewish Federation of Edmonton and members of the local Jewish community make to in creating a safe and a welcoming city for all. Therefore, I, Mayor Amarjit Sohi, do hereby proclaim January 27th, 2022, Holocaust Remembrance Day in Edmonton, Alberta's capital city. And thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you both for your meaningful words and your presence tonight and always alongside our community. I'd like to also take a quick moment to welcome other dignitaries that are here in attendance with us uh, virtually tonight. I know there are a number of city councillors from both Calgary and Edmonton here, and uh, I know that um, MLA uh, Whitney Isik is also here, and anybody who I'm missing, welcome, thank you. The Honourable Erwin Kotler is the founder and chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Centre for Human Rights, an Emeritus Professor of Law at McGill University, former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and an international human rights lawyer. Throughout his career, Erwin Kotler has demonstrated incredible leadership in the fight against racism, anti-Semitism, and hate. As Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada from 2003 to 2006, he launched Canada's first national justice initiative against racism and hate. In November 2020, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau named the Honourable Erwin Kotler as Canada's Special Envoy on Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Anti-Semitism. Erwin Kotler is simply one of the greatest defenders of the Jewish community in Canada and worldwide. We now welcome these recorded remarks from the Honourable Erwin Kotler. I'm delighted to participate in this commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, jointly organized by the Federations of Edmonton and Calgary, of the Public Libraries of Edmonton and Calgary, and with the participation of the mayors in these municipalities, and with your guest speaker, Ben Freeman. We meet at an important moment of remembrance and reminder of witness and warning. On the 77th anniversary of the liberation of the death camp Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century, a laboratory for mass murder for which there are no graves. A reminder of horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to have happened. A remembrance of the Holocaust, as Eloise El said, as a war against the Jews in which not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. A bearing witness to the mass murder of six million Jews and millions of non-Jews, not as a matter of abstract statistics, but as we say on such moments of remembrance, onto each person there is a name, each person is an identity, each person is a universe. And a warning, a warning to learn and to act upon the universal lessons of the Holocaust, of the Holocaust as a paradigm for radical evil, as anti-Semitism is a paradigm for radical hate. These lessons include the danger of forgetting and the imperative of remembrance. The dangers of hate and anti-Semitism. 1.3 million people were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. 
1.1 million of them were Jews. Let there be no mistake about it. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism itself did not die at Auschwitz. And it remains the bloodied canary in the mineshaft of global evil today. Of the dangers not only of Holocaust denial, but the increasing proliferation of Holocaust distortion, trivialization, and inversion, which themselves undermine the institutions of a democracy as they undermine democracy itself. Of the dangers of state-sanctioned incitement to hatred and contempt, as the Supreme Court of Canada put it so well. The Holocaust did not begin in the gas chamber, said the court. It began with words. These are the chilling facts of history. These are the catastrophic effects of racism. Of the dangers of silence in the face of evil, our responsibility to speak up, to stand up, and to act against injustice. Of the dangers of indifference and inaction in the face of mass atrocity. What makes the Holocaust and the genocides that have since followed so unspeakable are not only the horrors themselves, that would be bad enough. What makes the Holocaust and the genocides such as that of the Tutsis in Rwanda so unspeakable is that they were preventable. Nobody could say we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Just as with regard to the Rohingya and the Uyghurs today, we know and we are not acting. Of the dangers of la trahison des clercs, the betrayal of the elites. Nuremberg crimes were the crimes of the Nuremberg elites, of doctors and scientists, of judges and lawyers, of journalists and church leaders, of engineers and architects who themselves designed the death camp. Households, of the dangers of impunity and not bring war criminals to justice, of assaults on the vulnerable, one of the first groups targeted for destruction were the Jewish disabled, reminding us that the test of a just society is how does it treat its most vulnerable of minorities, and the importance and the imperative of acting on the injunction of never again, as Rao Wallenberg demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront injustice, prevail, and transform history. And so may I now close with a word to the survivors. For you have endured the worst of inhumanity, yet you somehow found in the resources of your own humanity, the will to go on, to form families, to build relationships, and to make endearing contributions to Calgary, to Edmonton, to our Canadian mosaic. And so may this International Day of Remembrance be not only a day of remembrance and reminder, which it is, but may it be also a remembrance to act, which it must be, on behalf of our common humanity. Thank you. On behalf of all of us, I would like to offer so many thanks to the Honorable Erwin Kotler for his special remarks. And for our keynote speaker tonight, I am so excited to introduce Ben Freeman. Born in Scotland, Ben is a gay Jewish author, internationally renowned educator, and diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist focusing on Jewish identity, combating anti-Jewish hate, and raising awareness of the Holocaust. His first book, Jewish Pride, Rebuilding a People, was released in February 2021 to great international acclaim. I can personally say, as an emerging Jewish leader, this book was both validating and inspiring. Since July 2020, Ben has spoken to over 150 different communities, organizations, companies, and institutions. Currently based in Hong Kong, 
Ben now heads up the humanities team at an American international school and lectures on anti-Semitism at Hong Kong universities. Through his work, he aims to educate, inspire, and empower both Jewish and non-Jewish people from all over the world. We are so fortunate to have Ben joining us this evening, which is already his 35th birthday in Hong Kong, to discuss how his experiences have led him to the important work he does, his thoughts on current events, and how we can continue to remember the Shoah and foster our own Jewish pride. Welcome, Ben, and we are so honored to have you. Thank Before you so we begin much. with our own questions tonight, I just want to remind the audience that if you would like to submit your own questions for Ben, feel free to do so in the chat, and we will endeavor to get onto those later on this evening. Yeah, uh, so again, welcome, so welcome, Ben. We're so excited to have you, as you can tell by how excited I am. <laughs> um, and so first up, uh, tell us a little bit about your life uh, growing up Jewish in Scotland and what drew you to Holocaust education and a life in the Jewish advocacy space. Growing up as a Jew in Scotland was like growing up as a wizard in the muggle world. Someone made a comparison to this and I thought it was really apt. We were Scottish. I wore a kilt to my bar mitzvah. I wore kilts to my siblings' weddings. But when you came in my home, when you entered my house, it was very clear you were entering into a different culture. We had mezuzot on the walls, we had Judaica, like Hanukkiot, we had separate dishes, there was pictures of rabbis on the wall, pictures with Hebrew writing, and I always felt separate, I always felt, I always understood that I was Jewish and that meant I was different, but it was never a bad thing. I think sometimes people perceive difference to be negative. I was always very proud of being Jewish. I was always very proud that my home looked like this. And especially when I went to high school, I was very proud that my life was slightly different to those around me because I understood I was part of a very long and ancient tradition. I would say that my relationship with my Jewishness changed somewhat when I went to university. I attended the University of Glasgow in 2005, and it was there that I first encountered left-wing Jew hate. And back then, I mean, we're talking a long time ago, over 15 years, and there was not the language we have today to discuss left-wing Jew hate. We didn't even really recognize that it was Jew hate. Although instinctively I knew that what was being said to me was wrong and I knew that it was anti-Jewish. So when I was called a white supremacist, a racist, a colonizer, an imperialist, just because I supported Israel's right to exist, I understood that there was something very wrong with that. At the same time, around the same time, I came out as gay and I saw something very peculiar, which I still see to this day, I saw the non-Jewish world that I was surrounded by embrace me for being gay. They were so happy, they wanted to celebrate me, they wanted to go to pride events with me, but I saw the complete double standards to which my Jewishness was treated. So when I would talk about being Jewish, when I would talk about Holocaust remembrance, when I would talk about um, Israel, I was met with scorn and I was really shamed for it. And in terms of Holocaust education, I've always been obsessed with history. I've always loved history. I've always really understood that to understand the present, we have to understand the past. And being Jewish, there was not a time in my life that I didn't know about the Holocaust. And that is part of really of a separate conversation, right, about the trauma that is um, imposed onto Jews because of the Holocaust. Even Jews, you know, born in the 1980s with no direct connection to the, to the Shoah. But I always found myself drawn to it. I always found myself fascinated by it and I wanted to understand why, how could this have happened? And I've had the privilege of leading trips to Poland. I've been to Auschwitz, I've visited Auschwitz seven times and led trips. And each time I would learn more and I'd understand more from an intellectual perspective. But even after doing this for 15 years, the emotion never gets any easier because ultimately we're dealing with the destruction of people, of course, but of our people. And then maybe just to follow up on that quickly, what's the experience like of Holocaust education in Hong Kong? Holocaust education in Hong Kong is actually fairly good. I work at this American international school and they allow me to teach basically what I want, which is one of the reasons I love working there. And I teach an annual three-month class on the Holocaust. 
And I know in other schools, they do trips to Poland, you know, COVID permitting, of course. Um, there, are, I, I first came out to Hong Kong as the director of education for the Holocaust Center here. And I would be going to all of the international schools, some of the local schools, and I'd be teaching lessons on the Holocaust. But I don't think that it's accompanied by the very necessary lessons on due hate. So when I start my classes, we start historical context from 2000 years ago. Holocaust education in Hong Kong, like much Holocaust education in other parts of the world, really focuses on events themselves and doesn't give that very crucial context to helping people understand how this could have happened. Ben, you mentioned uh, trauma, and um, we know that intergenerational trauma is an area that we're, we're starting to understand more these days, it sheds light on how our community is grappling with the Holocaust and anti-Semitism uh, 80 years after the Holocaust. So tell us a little bit about your understanding of intergenerational trauma. What is, what is unique about it to our community? Uh, and how does it help us relate to other communities that are experiencing the same phenomenon? I think what is key to understanding Jewish intergenerational trauma is that it is far beyond the Holocaust. You know, it was been referenced already this evening that Jew hate is the oldest hatred. And that means we have been inheriting this trauma for thousands of years. The expulsion from our indigenous homeland, the expulsion from Spain and Portugal, the various pogroms that took place in Europe, the crimes against Jews in the Middle East and North Africa. And these are passed on through generations because they're part of our family story. They're part of the cultural conversation. So when I said I never knew a time or I don't remember a time in my life that I didn't know about the Holocaust, Let's take a step back for a second and think, what does that do to a young person? That I grew up knowing in living memory, because I was born in 1987, so there were still many, many survivors with us. I grew up knowing that in living memory, the world conspired either through action or inaction to destroy the entire Jewish people. I also knew the reasons that my family were in Scotland. You know, it's funny, I've got students at my school who are Scottish and they say to me, well, what's your tartan? I say, we don't have a tartan. We were refugees. So we're, we're Scottish because I was born in Scotland, but my family weren't Scottish. And then why were my family in Scotland? My grandfather was brought over as a baby from Lithuania as a refugee fleeing pogroms. And I think what is so imperative to understand is that this impacts us in a very real and tangible way. So I've had many instances where this trauma has been triggered in my everyday life in situations that seemingly have absolutely nothing to do with Jewish people or the Holocaust. There was one experience I'll share very quickly. I was in Hong Kong waiting for pizza and it was last December and COVID restrictions were as they are now. The restaurants were closed at six o'clock, but you could get takeaway. And the Hong Kong police came down the street with a megaphone and they taped off the top of the street and then they proceeded to tape off the bottom of the street. And I started having a panic attack. And I know cognitively that that situation had absolutely nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with Jewish people, but it triggered a trauma in me being in a space and being next to or surrounded by police who were acting in a kind of aggressive way. And that is just one example. Every single Jewish person I, speaks to, I speak to, excuse me, talks about how the Nazis were some kind of boogeymen for them. They had nightmares about the Nazis. They were afraid that Hitler would climb in the window to take them away, to kidnap them. This is traumatic and it's visited upon us. And the difficult thing that we have to understand is that, again, it's not just the Holocaust. So we have a huge amount of trauma to be dealing with. And it really does stretch back from thousands of years. And I think it's really important to understand that while we have our own relationship with it, intergenerational trauma, epigenetic trauma, which is a field that's emerging, isn't just a Jewish story. They, a recent study was done that said babies born in Rwanda from mothers who were alive at the time of the Rwandan genocide, their genomes were changed. They've seen, they've seen similar studies with regard to the Holocaust. So this is a human experience. But absolutely, as kind of all things connected to Jewish history do, it has, Jewish history do for us, it has a specific story. And it's vital, I'll repeat again, it's not just from the Shoah. It's not just from the Holocaust. And this is something our community must begin to emotionally come to terms with and heal from, because that's really the only option. We cannot change the past, of course. We just have to heal going forward. And that was... So powerful. And thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences with us as well. Um, 
So now I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts because something that I keep hearing a lot when I kind of take in like any kind of Holocaust education, whether that be when I went on the March of the Living in high school or talking about it with my peers through other Jewish programs, is we keep hearing this idea that um, the last Holocaust survivor could very well pass away during my lifetime. And so I'm curious what you see as the future of Holocaust education when, in a world without Holocaust survivors. I think it's a really fantastic question, and I think it's something the entire field is really grappling with. And I think there are no concrete answers and there's no right answers. I think what we have to do is ensure that we have captured the stories of as many survivors as possible. Because the reality is we have to accept, regardless of how great an educator you are, you cannot tell their story better than they can. And what we've seen is that actually the video recordings are not as impactful as we thought they might be. Of course, they play a part. But what I think is really important is collecting the stories of these people. And I mean their whole stories, not just the stories from when they were experiencing Nazi persecution. But what were their lives like before? Where did they live? What were they interested in? What were their hobbies like? And what were their lives like afterwards? Where did they go? How did they rebuild their lives? I think what is absolutely imperative when we tell their stories, particularly as we are not um, eyewitnesses, it's not first person, we have to... Uh, we have to demonstrate that they were complete people. So often with the Holocaust, particularly so often with survivors, they're painted as people who, who experienced this, this snapshot of history and that is where they are kind of stuck. But they were people before with loves and laughs and lives and they were people afterwards. And I think it's so important we tell those, those whole stories. I think another major component is teaching the history of Jew hate. The story of the Holocaust did not begin in 1933. It began thousands of years ago and it is still being written today. So to ensure that the lessons of the Holocaust are understood, to ensure that the Holocaust itself is never forgotten, we have to put it in its proper context. And that requires a huge amount of time because we have to make sure that the educators, I mean, let's speak from a very practical perspective, we have to make sure that the educator is the one delivering the lessons that they understand themselves. So we have to do a huge amount of teacher training. We have to spend resources training teachers all over the world, making sure they understand it. And we have to put, again, and we have done for many years, but additional emphasis and effort into ensuring we capture as many stories as possible, because it is our responsibility. We bear witness and we have to make sure that going forward, everyone also bears witness, even without the survivors there. You know, uh, Ben, as we as we take today to remember the Holocaust, um, the elephant in the room is is obviously that globally the Jewish community is is alarmed at the at the recent rise in anti-Semitism. A huge part of your work is uh, about the importance of Jews not being defined mm. by anti-Semitism, but rather embracing and taking pride in what we know is our strong moral and strong spiritual identity. Now, with that, you you take a tremendous amount of time defining anti-Semitism in your in your book and and in your work, um, and you feel very strongly, I, I believe, about the the IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, definition of anti-Semitism. Why is it so important to define, and what do you see as the importance of that particular definition? I think hate in general is very important to define because not necessarily everyone understands it. I mean, how can we expect people to understand Jew hate if A, they've never studied it, or even B, if they're not Jewish? And any kind of definition is vitally important. The most important thing about IRA is that it's a working definition, which means that it was designed to evolve. And I think what's also important is that it lives in the current reality. We can talk, we can talk in hypotheticals, we can talk in theory and say, well, this technically isn't Jew hate in theory, so therefore, okay, you could then infer that, well, no example of that can be Jew hate. Ira does the opposite. Ira lives in reality. And it says, while this at its core may not be Jew hate, as it is expressed with regards to Jews today, as it is expressed with regards to Israel, it is a form of Jew hate. And I think that's so important. And I think it's really important just in general that we understand it because people don't understand Jew hate. I just saw before I logged on this call, Ilhan Omar, the rather infamous congresswoman from the United States who's long been accused of Jew hate. She did a post, a Twitter post about the Holocaust. 
and she referenced religious hatred. Now, anyone who understands anything about the Holocaust will understand it was not a form of religious hatred. It was a form of racial hatred. The Nazis put great emphasis in creating racial laws that defined full Jew, half Jew, three quarter Jew. And this was their, this was part of their attempt to rid the world of the Jews in what they perceived to be as a race. Now, I would not say the Jews are a race. I would say that races don't actually exist. But what we have to understand is that groups are racialized and the Nazis racialized Jews. So for Ilhan Omar to speak out to her many, many thousands, perhaps even millions of Instagram followers and describe the Holocaust as a form of racial discrimination means that she does not understand it. And that is just one example of this. And what happens if the world doesn't understand it is that Jews are then gaslit. We're gaslit to be told, well, actually, what you've experienced isn't Jew hate. Well, I don't think that was Jew hate. I think you're being a little bit sensitive. It is very important for us to be validated in our own experiences. And it's very important for our non-Jewish allies to have a guide which helps them work out what is and what isn't Jew hate. Because they're, they're operating in this world as well. They're not necessarily experts, so it is absolutely vital and it is practical. And that's what a lot of this work has to be. Yes, the theory, yes, the intellectual thought is vitally important, but the biggest question is how do we distill it to in an accessible way to everyone so that they can also understand it and help make the world a better place by ridding it of Jew hate? Well, uh, Ben, let me, let me ask you something. With respect to the IRA definition specifically, one of the most contentious pieces, but I would argue one of the most critical pieces, are the illustrative examples that relate to Israel. Mm. How important are they to defining anti-Semitism? They are crucial because, again, the reality of our situation today, post-Holocaust, is that anti-Zionism, which is the belief that Jews do not have the right to self-determination in their indigenous land, is a form of anti-Jewish hatred. We have to understand that. We have to understand that the obsessive global focus, and let's not you know, mince words, it is obsessive. This obsessive hatred the world has towards Israel is because of Jew hate. Israel is treated as the collective Jew, the Jew among nations, and it is targeted in the same way that individual Jews and individual Jewish communities were targeted for thousands of years. And this is particularly important in the post-Holocaust world, because something we have to understand um, in the period that followed the Holocaust, is that overt Jew hatred became taboo. Now, that's not me saying it went away. It did not go away. It was just driven to the fringes of society, and it was driven underground. So people were still saying things in their own homes, but they were not saying it publicly. So those who wished to continue to persecute Jews those who made sense of their world through anti-Jewish conspiracy fantasy, they had to find new methods. And one of the methods the Soviet Union specifically found was demonizing Israel, treating Israel with double standards and delegitimizing it as a form of Jew hatred. And we have to understand that. And this, this is particularly why IRA is so important, because it helps illustrate these examples. And some people say, well, you know, IRA stops freedom of speech. It actually does the opposite. It encourages freedom of speech because it gives you the information to criticize Israel without accidentally sliding into Jew hate. It gives people a way to have conversations about Israel without being afraid, without perhaps leaning on tropes inadvertently because Jew hate is embedded in society and some people can or many people can express it without even being aware of it. So it's a guide. And I think that the reaction against it is really a reaction against, is a reaction from people who wish to be anti-Jewish specifically towards Israel and they don't want to be called out for it. Wow. Um, ben, especially as someone who attends a very progressive university, I can say that being able to think of things within the context of the IRA definition of anti-Semitism has been really powerful for me and a lot of other people. So thank you. Um, and among the many facets of who you are, two of the foremost aspects of your identity reside in the intersectionality of being gay and being Jewish. In many instances, Jews are being asked to choose between their Jewish identity and a progressive identity. And of course, as a queer progressive Jew, I know that's a completely absurd and false dichotomy. In your book, you kind of discuss this dilemma and how much from a pride perspective, the Jewish community can learn from the LGBTQ plus community. So tell us a little bit about that. 
So you're absolutely right. And it's really one of the tragic things, especially for Jews with intersection identities, because we are very much being asked to choose between them. So I have to choose, am I gay or am I a proud Jewish Zionist? And, you know, there are some spaces where I can be both, but there's many spaces, particularly political LGBTQ plus spaces, where I cannot be. And I have been expelled from what David Hirsch calls the community of the good. And it's incredibly harmful because when I came to my LGBTQ plus pride or my LGBTQ plus identity, that was at the end of a long journey of self-acceptance. So I was born, as I said earlier, 1987, for the first 10 years of my life, it was illegal to talk about LGBTQ plus people in schools, literally illegal. So the laws that Russia has currently, Britain had for the first 10 years of my life, and that impacted the culture. So casual homophobia was very, very common. And I internalized that and I became ashamed of who I was. So I had to work incredibly hard to become comfortable with my LGBTQ plus identity. So the fact that the spaces which I worked so hard to join are now asking me to choose between that and another part of my identity, which I cannot shed. I cannot shed my Jewishness, you know, nor can I shed my LGBTQ plus identity. And the way that I found to kind of marry these two identities and really to find inner peace was pride. And as I said, you know, I, I came to my LGBTQ plus identity at the end of a long road and I was at rock bottom in my very early 20s. So as you said, today's my 35th birthday. So that's about 15 years ago. And mm -hmm. I reached and I reached rock bottom. But I realized something very fundamental. I realized, oh, I've done nothing wrong. I was born this way. I've done nothing wrong. And I'm being punished for a crime I hadn't committed. And that set me on the long path to pride. Now, when I was watching the Jeremy Corbyn crisis from Hong Kong, Jeremy Corbyn being the leader of the, the former leader of the Labour Party, who is a racist against Jewish people, when I was watching that and I felt compelled to join this fight against him, I saw something very interesting. On the one hand, I saw British Jews emit and embody such incredible Jewish pride. They came together, they stood as one, and everyone knows the old adage, you have three Jews, you have 15 opinions. It was remarkable seeing the Jewish community speak as one for the most part. I also saw though, I also saw Jews who were suffering from what I call the hangover of the keep your head down policy. This unofficial policy of the Jewish world, we were told, don't say anything. Just keep your head down and get on with it. Don't stand up for yourself. And I reflected on my, LG, my, my path to LGBTQ plus pride. And I reflected that in that journey that I took, I understood that I had a responsibility to speak up for the LGBTQ plus community. And I understood that Jews have the exact same responsibility and the exact same right. We are allowed to advocate for ourselves. We are allowed to defend ourselves. And that was the inspiration for my book, Jewish Pride Rebuilding the People and this modern Jewish pride movement. And I think it's really important that we encourage and we give space to people with intersectional identities to be able to come to some kind of peace, peaceful resolution between any conflict that may exist. But yeah, it's an absolute tragedy that I feel expelled from the LGBTQ plus community. And I would say that I no longer feel a part of the progressive world. However, that does not mean my values are changed. No one gets to change my values. My values are what my values are. And I would refer to my values as progressive values, even if I no longer feel comfortable in progressive spaces. And I think a lot of the time, as you said, Jordan, people are being asked to choose. The reality is we don't have to choose. We exist in ourselves. We are whole in ourselves. And though they may try to make us choose, we don't have to because they cannot take these inherent parts of us, whether it's our identity or our values away from us. Ben, in, in addition to your work as a Holocaust educator, uh, many know you. I stumbled across you first from your Twitter presence. Um, you're, you're a real warrior out there and boy you're a lot younger than I am but you really inspired a lot in me uh recently on the heels of the hostage incident in Colleyville you wrote being a Jew in the non-Jewish world feels like being in a swimming pool with people constantly taking turns trying to drown us by holding our heads underwater while all the people standing around totally ignoring our cry okay uh, that's a pretty depressing thought. Um, I can I can relate to it as we watch that 
situation unfold. I don't think anybody knows outside of our community or few know how even though that event took place for many of us hundreds or thousands of miles away, how we were all shaken by it. Now, assuming that those who want to drown us may always want to drown us, how do we reach those who are ignoring our cries? I think that's a really vital question. And they're the don't knows. They're the people who may not know the information, who may not care very much, but they are the people we need to, to reach. When I was teaching the Holocaust a few years ago to my students, they kept asking me, but how is it, how is Jew hate still a problem? You know, we understood what was said about Jews in the Middle Ages. We understood what was said about Jews in the 18th, 19th century. We understand what was said about Jews by the Nazis. Why is it still a problem today? When my students feel a million miles away from those events, and I created a model called the cloud. It's the cloud of Jew hate. And it's constantly drizzling over society. And for some people, it goes right to their very core through osmosis. I'm not a scientist, but I believe that's called osmosis. And... It goes right to their core and they hate us. These people hate us. For the most other people, and really most other people, it stays on the surface of their skin. And yes, they participate in anti-Jewish hatred. They even parrot some of these ideas because they're socialized into a way of thinking. And how do we turn those people into allies? Well, to stop rain or to stay dry from rain, what do we have to do? We have to develop umbrellas. So through education, through challenging conversations, through critical thinking, we encourage people to open their umbrellas. Now, the beautiful thing about umbrellas is that they can spread. So if I have an umbrella, I can teach other people and then they can open their umbrellas. And what we have to approach these, uh, these conversations with is empathy. And it's very hard because, as you say, that was a very strong statement I put out and we are screaming for help and it feels often that we're being ignored. But we have to think about it from the other's perspective. Jew hate is not really um, spoken about in the international stage. Modern Jew hate, I mean, in the same way that other forms of prejudice are. So it is, a, it is really a, a possibility that there are people who do not know that it exists today. So when we approach conversations to encourage allyship, we have to approach from a space of empowerment, uh, with a perspective of empathy, and with education. We're not shaming people for not knowing. We want people to join us, and we want people to understand, non-Jewish people to understand, their responsibility to combat Jew hatred. But we do so by educating, by sharing our stories, by dialoguing. And I think that's really important because, you know, I've had the opportunity to speak with non-Jewish people who have read my book and who have seen the things I post on Twitter. And they feel, they tell me, they feel empowered. And being an ally is a brave thing. To go inside yourself and to deal with your own bias, to engage in introspection is brave. It takes courage. Not everyone wants to do that. It can be uncomfortable. So to facilitate that process, to give people the strength, we have to educate them and be empathetic and be, um, as I said, non-judgmental. Now, that doesn't mean we are giving people endless chances. At some point, it becomes your responsibility to educate. If we speak and people do not listen or people close their hearts and ears to us, that then is their problem. But we do have to approach this from a space of education. And it is hard. It's hard because we're, you know, we have many wonderful things about our experience. We have immense amounts of Jewish pride, but we're also dealing with trauma and shame and pain. And it is hard, but we have to understand that each of us play a role. And the role that we have is to help everyone around us open their umbrellas. Wow, Ben, that was really, that was such a fantastic metaphor. And I don't actually think I've heard it before. Um, so that was really cool. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I think I'm too Gen Z to follow your Twitter, but I am a huge fan of your Instagram. Um, and kind of on that vein, um, as a young advocate myself, I do find that the number of important causes that need our help is kind of overwhelming. It feels difficult sometimes to you know, keep my energy high and maintain hope when so many communities, including our own, are facing so much danger and hate in today's world. As an activist, what gives you hope? And what advice do you have for young proud Jews such as myself who need the energy to keep up this important work? Well, people like you give me hope. And really, truly, it's we have seen something change in the Jewish world. We have seen a reclamation of our identity, a reclamation 
or a reclaiming is a reclamation of word. We have seen a reclaiming of our identity, a reclaiming of our story, and we're not going to allow it to, to be defined by the non-Jewish world. And that is okay. That's not saying we want to be supremacists. We're not saying we don't want non-Jewish allies. Of course we do. But just as I don't tolerate heterosexual society defining what it means to be gay, Jews are no longer permitting the non-Jewish world to define our identity. We're standing up and we're talking about our experiences. We're talking about the beauty, the pain, our indigeneity, our history. And that gives me a huge amount of hope because this was not something that was happening in the same way five years ago. When I first started talking about Jewish pride, I was told, we don't need this. Just be quiet, we don't need this. And I think what we've seen is that we do need it and that people all over the world have been inspired by it. And the main aim I see of leadership is to creating more leaders. So if my work has inspired someone like you, uh, not just an emerging leader, a young student leader, then that is the hope because you're taking the message on because we're Judaism and Jewishness does not belong to us. We are custodians. We take care of it for the next generations. And that's something that's so incredibly vital to understand about the, the wider Jewish experience, but particularly during the Holocaust, the incredible resistance that existed, that has always existed. Jews fought back to be proud, to reclaim, to own their Jewishness. Sometimes that, that resistance took place in, in physica physically, but sometimes we saw in the Holocaust, it was just people lighting menorahs, lighting Shabbat candles. I even heard a story of a woman, a Jewish woman, who fasted in Auschwitz on Yom Kippur, even though you know, that it, she didn't need to because of the life-saving um, priority that exists in the Jewish world. We have always fought and defended and resisted. And that is what Jewish pride is. So being inspired by those in the Shoah, those in the Holocaust, who would not allow their Jewishness to be taken from them, who went to the gas chambers saying the Shema, who went to the gas chambers saying Kaddish, that is so incredible and that is something that exists. And because of people like you and other young leaders and really the Jewish community all over the world, that continues to live on. This incredible commitment to the Jewish people and to Jewish pride. Uh, ben, we are now gonna open things up and we've been getting a number of questions in from our audience and, and the overwhelming question um, and uh, you know what our, our title tonight and the big Part of what we want to do is, is provide people with uh, education around the history of Jew hatred. So I'll sum up a few questions. Why have Jewish people been the targets of hatred for 2,000 years? Mm. Give us uh, uh, some history on this. It's such a great and important question. And there is an answer. And I think I remember growing up and people would say, well, it's just happened and we can't really understand why. No, we do understand why. It's actually not about Jews, which is kind of a strange thing to say. This is really a non-Jewish problem, and it's a non-Jewish problem which impacts Jews. But the problem, again, of, of Jew hate doesn't begin in our community. It begins outside of our community. But where does it begin? We saw in the ancient world, we saw our indigenous land, the Jewish kingdoms of Israel and Judah, later Judea, colonized and taken over by great powers. The Persians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, this is in no particular order the Greeks and the Romans. And those cultures really created Western culture, right? The Greek thinking, Greek way of thinking and Roman way of thinking. So there is this, um, we start to see an embedding of these ideas in Western culture, but it really took on a very important phase and it really became deeply embedded with the birth of Christianity. The story started with the birth of Christianity because Jesus was a Jew. The early Christians were Jews. And at some point with Paul, they had to justify this separation, this split, this parting of the ways, because they had to justify, well, why are we no longer Jewish? So what we saw, and a similar process happened in the Muslim world, but I'm going to speak specifically about the Western world, because that is where I'm from and we all live. What we saw is Paul and other early Christians at the time begin to define themselves in opposition to Jews because it was a marketing exercise they had to define why they were no longer Jews so they said okay the Jews are going to circumcise we're not going to circumcise the Jews will keep kosher we're not going to keep kosher that's very practical but then it became a little bit more kind of theological it was the Jews are earthly we're spiritual the Jews are practical we're heavenly 
And this set in motion this idea which eventually became known as, in Latin, adversos judeos, against the Jews. And remember, this isn't about Jews. This is about the non-Jewish world. And it was about Christian ideas of Jews. So there were people who would label you a Jew, label you a Judaizer as a way to insult you, as a way to denigrate you, as a way to demonize their enemies. And this started the embedding of Jew hatred in European and therefore Western culture. And it developed over thousands of years. And it really took on a very important face with the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity. Because the Romans, just 350 years earlier, had murdered the man who they now consider to be their Lord, their Savior. So they had to find a new scapegoat. They had to find a scapegoat, and they found the Jews. And they had their own dealings with us, so it wasn't that they just plucked us out of a hat. But when Rome converted to Christianity, all of those Christian ideas that we just spoke about became political. They became part of the Roman imperial system that was spread all over Europe and to other places also. So that was really how this became embedded. And like a weed, the roots to this are very, very, very deep. And some people have come along and they tried to chop off the weed at the ground level but it's always grown back. So even after the Enlightenment, even after the destruction of the church's real power in Europe, these ideas remained. And what we see is that Jew hate, because it's so part of this ideology, this non-Jewish Christian ideological way of thinking, it began to evolve to fit the zeitgeist. One of my students in Hong Kong refers to it as the same soup, a different bowl. The outward changes, the bowl changes, but the core always stays the same. And that is what we see today. I mentioned that post-Holocaust Jew hate was really focused on Israel. That is why these changes occur, because it's always evolving to fit the world in which it exists. And when people think of Jew hate, they need to understand, as I said, it's not about Jews. This is about non-Jewish ideas of Jews and non-Jewish perceptions of the role that Jews play. We are used to make sense of the world. So Jew hate, in many ways, you could describe as a conspiracy fantasy but it is one that is beyond deeply embedded. It played a foundational role in many of the societies in which we live, and it's one of the reasons it hasn't been defeated to this day. Wow, Ben, it's, it's definitely difficult to summarize, you know, 2,000 years of the history of anti-Jewish hate in, you know, just a couple of minutes, but I think you pretty much did as, as good a job as any of us could do. Um, and kind of thinking about this vein, um, many Jewish advocates, obviously including yourself, are using the term Jew hate or anti-Jewish hate instead of anti-Semitism. Do you want to tell us a little bit about why that is? Absolutely. So professionally, I don't use the word anti-Semitism any longer. And I came to that conclusion really with Jewish pride and, and through that process, because I believe that Jewish pride, as I said, is about reclaiming Jewish identity, reclaiming Jewish story. And what many people don't understand is that the word anti-Semitism was used, was coined to legitimize a hatred of Jews. So it was coined in 1879 by Wilhelm Marr, and it was coined to replace the older Judenhass, Jew hate, because the 19th century was a time of, you know, great intellectual thought and evolution of ideas. And what he wanted to do was position Jew hate alongside those ideas. So it wasn't a hatred, it was an ideology. And let's pick apart the word. So if we look at the middle part, the Semitic, the, Semiti the Semitism part, basically, we ask, what is that? OK, so there are no Semitic people. There are Semitic languages. So Aramaic, Amharic, Hebrew, Arabic, they are Semitic languages. And in Europe at that time, there was a lot of obsession with language as a, as a signifier of belonging. So if they say, so for example, if they, um, if someone didn't speak German, then they weren't German because you had to speak German to belong to be a German. And because Jews had their own languages, we had Yiddish for the Ashkenazi Jews and other languages for the other sub-ethnic communities, but we also had Hebrew. It was a language that wasn't quite dead. People think that in the diaspora for those 2000 years, Hebrew was dead, it wasn't. It was still being spoken in certain places and it was still being used in our prayers. So it was a, an idea that, okay, 
if Jews speak a certain language, then we can infer certain things about their biology, which is a form of racism. It was race theory, pseudoscience. So anti-Semitism as a word was a racist way of defining and othering Jewish people. And I understand that it's just become part of the lexicon, but I think that we should be reclaiming our identity and our story, and we should not be using a word that was intended to destroy us to describe what we experience today, particularly when a word that I often use is anti-Jewish racism. And many people don't understand that Jew hate is a form of racism. Ben, you mentioned uh, the, the very challenging years that British Jews faced, um, you know, with the rise of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, what role, and you know, you're obviously you're more familiar with the BBC and the Guardian than you are with with our national media, but we've had a question about and, and concerns expressed about the role that the media is playing, whether it's um, you know our national broadcaster suggesting that there were uh, somewhere around six million sort of casually. Is that a number that's up for debate? But what role did the media play in in that uh, challenge that British Jews faced? They played an absolutely central role. The media is one of the conduits of the reign of Jew hate. So examples from that specific period, they always put anti-Semitic in quotation marks as if they're not really sure. They described this crisis, this racist crisis that was happening at the very center of British political life. Let's remember that Jeremy Corbyn's official title was Her Majesty's Most Loyal Opposition. So he had an official role in our political system. The crisis was described as a row. So when I say that to people from the United States, they, they because of my accent, can't work out what row means, and it's a quarrel. It was not a quarrel. We were targeted. The you know, opposition political party actively targeted a tiny minority, a tiny ethno-religious minority that was living in the United Kingdom. That is what happened. And the media played an enormous role, and we see it today. The BBC in March of last year had a debate, a live debate on the BBC, and the question was, should Jews count as an ethnic minority? Should we count? And one of the, the reasons given by the presenter was, well, you know, Jews are very affluent. That is a form of economic libel, which paints Jews as being obsessed with money and is incredibly dangerous. And the media have played an enormous role. And we saw it even recently with the BBC during Hanukkah. There was a busload of children attacked and the BBC lied. And they said the boys on the bus shouted an anti-Muslim slur to incite the attackers because Jews can never just be victims. Well, it must be the Jews' fault. The Jews must have done something. So what that did was that created doubt. Oh, maybe this wasn't anti-Semitic. Maybe this wasn't anti-Jewish. Maybe, maybe the people outside were responding to racism. So the media have played an absolutely central role. And I think that the media have to take a huge responsibility. And it's very nice to see people in media all over the world marking Holocaust Memorial Day. But their pledges to remember, honestly, mean absolutely nothing if they're not combating the problem that still exists today. And not only are they not combating it, they are adding fuel to the fire. Wow, absolutely. Um, and again, I just wanna thank everyone who's submitting questions. We are getting quite a few, so we're trying to work through as many as we can. But uh, with that, um, I'd like to take another audience question that I thought was really powerful. And so that was, uh, does the panel and Ben believe that some of the more popularized, in quotations, stories of the Holocaust, so for example, uh, Schindler's List or The Pianist, uh, have they become too reliant on the stories of Jewish allies rather than Jewish people themselves? Um, and I'll leave that question for you, Ben, speaking as a, a member of the panel. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, they, they don't focus on Jewish stories. They focus on the non-Jewish savior. So if we think about, you know, the way anti-Black racism is often focusing, or stories about anti-Black racism of, often focus on the non-Black saviour, it's the same thing. And that's not to say we shouldn't tell those stories. We should tell those stories because they happened and they're important. But there's no context given. There's no, 
humanity really given to the to the Jews other than being victims, other than experiencing what was done to them. We are not passive actors in our own life. As I said, even during the Shoah, we stood up and we resisted. We reclaimed our Jewishness or we claimed our Jewishness. We fought back in all of the death camps, in many of the ghettos. We stood up and we fought. So there's this idea that, oh, we were just sitting around waiting for people to save us and we were going like lambs to the slaughter. It's not true. And not only that, but they were people beforehand. What were their lives like beforehand? Where did they live? Where did they go to school? What were their hobbies? They were real people. And so often the focus is on the non-Jewish saviour. So Schindler's List, Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which is very problematic from other reasons as well. And it's not that we don't tell those stories, but we have to tell them in context. The Jews were also working to save themselves. We're fighting desperately against the crushing machine of the world to save themselves. And we do have to understand that. So we're not disregarding the righteous. We have to acknowledge those stories, but absolutely we're not gonna pretend that those are the only stories and the only ways that Jews were saved. And there's so much more to Jewish people than just being victims. And I say we're not victims. We're absolutely not victims. We're resilient, we're survivors. And those are the stories that we should be telling, the absolute incredible stories where Jews stood up and defended themselves. And that can be, as I said previously, by lighting the Shabbat candles or by throwing grenades at the Nazis in the Warsaw Ghetto. You're muted, Jared. Had to happen once. <laughs> I was scared it was going to be me. <laughs> you know, Ben, you you wear very two very important hats, and you wear them well. On one hand, you're a Holocaust educator, and on the other, you're still fighting the battle uh, of current anti-Semitism. How important? A question we had is how important uh, is it to accompany the teachings on the Holocaust with current events? How do we intertwine them? You mentioned, we see people, you know, press honoring International Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, but really sort of paying it lip service. It's, it's, it couldn't be more important. We have to, there is a story to be told and the Holocaust is an incredibly important chapter in that story, but it's not the only chapter. And we have to show how we got there. So like any story, you're not gonna start on chapter 17 out of 30. You're going to start in chapter one, and that's what we must do. So obviously I'm talking there a little bit more historical, but you don't stop reading in chapter 17 either. You continue to the end, and our story hasn't finished. So, you know, the, maybe the book analogy is not so perfect, but the chapters are being added, but it's absolutely vital. I've been told by people, or I've been asked, so is, is, is do you hate really a thing? Did it, was it still a thing after the Holocaust? And it's like, yes, it continued in just a real way, than it had done previously. And we are experiencing a version of that story today. Our experiences are not disconnected. The events that led to the Shoah are the same events that are, you know, the, the stories that, that led to the Shoah are the same stories, ideas fueling our experience. And as I said, teaching the Holocaust is, is vitally important, but it's also been done very poorly. And I don't think that that's purposeful. I think that people have not understood how to do it. And I think that people have not been supported. So as we said earlier, we have to train the educators and we have to provide them with up-to-date resources which help them put the Holocaust in its context. Because the Holocaust was the murder of six million Jewish people in the middle of Europe and in also in the Middle East and North Africa in the middle of the 20th century. It wasn't a freak aberration. And the story that led to it did not end after it. So we have to continue telling this story. So current events, you know, um, Pittsburgh, Poway, the appropriation of the Yellow Star we've seen all over Canada, Corbin, Beth Israel, Hamas, all of these things are part of the story. And like anything, if you're a good educator, you want to tell as much of the story as you can. You, you mentioned the appropriation of... Uh symbols of the Holocaust uh, in, in, in rallies, um, in protests. Well, I think a lot of people are unsure. I mean, I think as a community, we understand how offensive it is. Mm. Describe 
from your perspective, help people understand how offensive and why it is offensive for that kind of imagery, those kinds of comparisons to be made on our streets right now. Well, the Holocaust was not just this historical event. It happened to our families. And that is the symbol, the yellow star was the symbol they were forced to wear before they were herded into ghettos and before they were deported to death camps and murdered en masse in gas chambers. So it is an appropriation of Jewish pain and Jewish trauma. And it's something we see a huge amount. You know, I mentioned the, the uh, appropriation in Canada. It's happening all over the world. And it isn't just about the yellow star. Everything is compared to the Holocaust. Why? Because Jewish victimhood is being appropriated to claim victimhood. So what those anti-vaxxers are saying is that, well, I've got a yellow star on, and that means that I'm a victim. But those are our stories. Those are our family stories. And they're not a universal symbol. They're not something to be put on to make a point, a political point. They were forced on our bodies. And they were a symbol of the oppression that we experienced in those years. And it's enormously painful. The trauma of the Holocaust, and we mentioned this previously, of all Jew hate, but particularly the Holocaust, is still incredibly fresh. It is real, it is tangible, and we have to honour that. And for people to be so, so appropriative and careless with our experience and with our trauma, I find to be completely reprehensible. And I think you're right, you know, this speaks earlier to your question about defining Juhe, right, with Ira. We instinctively know when something is offensive, but we don't always have the language to explain why, because not not every conversation has been discussed, not every topic has been has been discussed. So this is something we have to talk about because it's painful. It's not just something that we're like, oh, screw those guys. This is something that is deeply offensive and is trivializing the Jewish experience and appropriating our pain to claim some kind of victimhood. And I see people every so often on Twitter say, the things that you can compare the Holocaust to are the Holocaust. And yeah, that's about right. You know, maybe if you're having a wider conversation about genocide, of course, other analogies and other conversations can be happening. But the reality is the Holocaust is a unique human experience, even though it was a genocide among many. The industrialization, the scale, the scope was unprecedented. And we will not allow that to be appropriated and we will not allow it to be trivialized. Absolutely. So I can say to that. <laughs> um, Something that um, I'm noticing coming up in the chat and that I've actually experienced um, a lot of myself, um, of course, as a student in university right now, and that's people, whether they're Jewish or not, that say, you know, I'm not anti-Jewish, I'm just anti-Zionist. Hmm. What's the best way to address a comment like that, regardless of who it comes from? I think the first step is to educate on what Zionism is. Zionism is a Jewish concept created by Jews for Jews in the middle of the 19th century. It is also deeply connected to thousands of years of Jewish history. So it is an inherent part of Jewish identity and experience, really. That's not to say that we have to support everything the Israeli government does. That's not what Zionism is. Zionism is the belief that Jews should have the right of self-determination in, in, in their indigenous land. That is what Zionism is. So if you're against that, Someone is telling us that they are against the right of Jews for, to have self-determination in their indigenous land. And these are not people, sometimes people say, well, what happens if you're against statehood in general, if you're an anarchist? Well, then you're not an anti-Zionist, you're against statehood. But the people who are anti-Zionist are simultaneously advocating for another people to establish a state in that land, the Palestinians. Now, of course, a two-state solution is the ideal solution to this conflict, but that requires Israel, the Jewish state, alongside a Palestinian state. It doesn't require or it doesn't mean that one will replace the other. So what we have to do is first of all educate on what Zionism is and then tell people Zionism is an inherent Jewish concept. It may have a specific 19th century flavor but it is an inherent Jewish idea. So to say that you're against the right of Jews to self-determination is treating us with double standards. I'm Scottish. The Scots are ne never stopped talking about independence. We had a vote in 2014 that was once in a lifetime and they're talking about it again. No one said to the Scots that your fight for self-determination in your homeland is racist. No one said that. 
because every group has a right to self-determination. And particularly when we talk about the rights of indigenous people and First Nations, that is particularly important. But it's only when Jews are in the equation, indigeneity can be revoked. Only when Jews are in the equation that we are treated with double standards. So what we do is we educate, but then we're very clear. It's not up for discussion. We have to proudly and strongly define our own experience and educate the non-Jewish world about that, and Jewish people as well. But just as I will never debate whether the Holocaust happened, I will also not debate whether anti-Zionism is a form of modern Jew hate, because it is. Uh, we're, we're getting actually, uh, all of a sudden, a lot of questions about Israel and the Palestinians. Um, and I know you're very well educated on the subject. Um, and so, you know, feel free to weigh in. I, I, I find it interesting that that's where the conversation often goes. Um, I guess one of the things that perhaps you want to touch on, Ben, first of all, you talked uh, a little bit about how galvanizing uh, the, the Jeremy Corbyn crisis was to British Jews. And we've mentioned that. Um, the crisis that erupted, the conflict that erupted in, in May, that re-erupted, and we'll certainly erupt again. Um, it seems like for some Jews, it galvanized them. Mm. And it seems like for some Jews, it made them want to run and hide. This was a particularly challenging conflict. So I welcome your thoughts on the conflict in general and the effect that it had on our community. The only thing I'll say about the conflict is because this is this is a Holocaust memorial event, so we're not going to go there. But one thing I will say is that the Jew hate that led to the Holocaust that has been around for thousands of years is what is also, at least in part, driving this conflict and driving global perception of this conflict. The other thing I will say, during the conflict in May, I was teaching this annual class on the Holocaust. And I had just taught lessons on 1933 when the conflict erupted. And in 1933, after the, the you know, election of the Nazis or, the, or when Hitler was appointed chancellor, we saw a grassroots uprising from the German people. Grassroots, it wasn't imposed by the Nazis. It was in every level of German society and it was to really go against um, uh, Judischergeist, Jewish spirit. It was, a, it was a, a, an act against Jewish spirit. That was 1933. In 1941, in June, the Nazis, the Germans, invaded the Soviet Union with Operation Barbarossa. In the days that followed the invasion of the Soviet Union, communities, in non-Jewish communities in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, had a grassroots uprising against the Jews, and they started murdering Jews before the Einsatzgruppen, before the mobile execution squads were active. In May 2021, we saw a grassroots uprising, another grassroots uprising against the Jews, both online and off. It came, it seemingly came from nowhere. And it was grassroots, it was from every level of society. We had convoys of cars driving through Jewish areas in London saying, send out your daughters, Jews. We had all of the terrible events in Canada. We had attacks in Los Angeles and New York, many events that took place in Europe. And then, of course, the Hamas rockets that were raining down on Israel. So what we have to understand is that that is part of the same story. This grassroots uprising has been seen before. And we have to recognize it. Because 1933, it was the German population. 1941, it was a Latvian, Lithuanian, Estonian population. And in 2021, it was the global population that rose up against Jews. And that is how we have to talk about that experience. So that is the only thing I will say about the conflict, because this is a conversation about Jew hate and the Holocaust. And as you say, they often seem to go there. And part of defining our own narrative is controlling the narrative. And today is a day to talk about Jew hate and the Shoah. And it's not to talk about Israel and the Palestinians. Well said. Well said. Very well said. Thank you, Ben. Um, so uh, kind of, I know we're kind of, looking towards the end of our discussion now, but um, thinking more now about how people can continue to educate themselves after this discussion, whether it be someone who's Jewish and just wants to learn more or someone who's non-Jewish and just wants to be an ally and doesn't know where to start. 
um, how can people educate themselves and, and especially their children about the Holocaust? Um, where do you suggest people start? I think that, you know, we mentioned it earlier, hearing from survivors. It's very important to hear from survivors when we can. So if we're ever given an opportunity to hear from a survivor firsthand, we should always take that. But also there's many, many stories written up. There's many historical accounts. There's many um, videos online of people speaking about their experiences. And I think that is where we start. You know, reading a book, going on a website, even if it's honestly just Wikipedia to start, because these are huge subjects. The, there is a page on Wikipedia that has, you know, list of anti-Jewish incidents, and it's ev literally every single century. So there's a lot to get through. So we have to start with the basics. And we have to talk about it with our, our children, our friends, honestly. We're not going to sugarcoat it. But we must understand how we talk about it, and that's with pride. So we're going to tell our children, this was done to us. This is how many people we lost. But look at all the amazing ways that we stood up for ourselves. Look how beautiful Jewishness and Judaism is. This is why it's something worth, worth fighting for. And I think for non-Jewish people, it's about giving space giving space to your Jewish friends to talk, giving space to different perspectives if you're reading them in a book or if you are seeing them on a website. Have the courage to dive into yourself, be open to hearing different perspectives. And the most important thing we remember is that the Jews who were murdered, the six million in the Holocaust, and then the other millions of people who were also murdered in subsequent Nazi, or, or simultaneous Nazi genocide to crimes against humanity, they were all people. They're not martyrs, they're not political footballs, they're people. So we have to approach the, the conversations on them with a huge amount of empathy, with, a, with our hearts open, but most importantly, with a desire to learn. So whether it's online, whether it's in you know, Martin Gilbert's The Holocaust, whether it's from someone's Instagram page, you know, learning can start in any place, but it's about starting that journey and keeping that journey going. You know, as a teacher, I'm gonna say, we're all lifelong learners. I'm continuously reading and learning and really what it teaches me is how much I don't know. So this is a never ending process. And, you know, that may be disheartening to some, but it's about starting it, putting that first step on this journey to understanding, to knowing, to being an ally or to being a proud Jew. I could well, not I... have said it better myself. <laughs> I can tell you, Ben, that that we we did good work tonight. We uh, prior to this starting, we had over 700 people registered. Many more came, and we know that that's reaching over a thousand Albertans and well beyond. Uh, so thank you in this endeavor tonight. Uh, sadly, because I, I I know that there are many questions out there. I we saw your questions. We appreciate your questions. I I, I regret that we can't get to them all. Um, there were also many uh, happy birthday wishes to Ben. Uh, but we do need to conclude. There will be a survey uh, as, as you log off. Um, ben, as we've seen from the number of people joining us tonight, the amount of engagement we've had in this discussion, that this is a topic of growing interest and concern to our community. Uh, from Deborah Lipstadt to Barry Weiss to Isaac DeCastro, Zioness, New Zionist Congress, and more, you stand among the inspired and the inspiring. Ben, the message we hear from all these advocates, educators, and organizations is this. We can't ignore the hate, but we mustn't be defined by it. As a community, we have so much to be proud of. Jew, Zionist, Israel, they are not dirty words. They are points of pride. Ben, thank you for joining us tonight to share your inspiring message Keep up your amazing work. Have a happy birthday. And again, on behalf of Calgary and Edmonton Jewish Federations and Calgary and Edmonton Public Libraries, Jordan and I thank you all for joining us tonight. Good night.